All right, well, I think I'm gonna get us started here. Thanks everyone for joining us for tonight's event. My name is Kevin, I'm one of the event hosts here at Powell's Books. Uh, before we begin, I want to encourage you to check out our lineup of upcoming virtual events by visiting our website at powells.com. One of the many events that we're looking forward to is Brian Evanson, who will be in conversation with Matt Bell, and that event is next Tuesday, August 3rd. And if you don't already do so, please follow us on social media, on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, and of course, our YouTube channel. Tonight, we are so thrilled to welcome Chuck Wendig and Cassandra Kaw. Chuck Wendig was a finalist for the John W. Campbell Award for Best New Writer and an alum of the Sundance Screenwriters Lab. And he served as the co-writer of the Emmy-nominated digital narrative, Collapsus. He's also known for his popular blog, Terrible Minds, and books about writing, such as Damn Fine Story. His first middle reader book, Dust and Grimm, is coming out October 5th, so look out for that. In his new literary thriller, The Book of Accidents, a family returns to their hometown and to the dark past that haunts them still. Long ago, Nathan Graves lived in a house in the country with his abusive father and has never told his family what happened in that house. Long ago, Maddie Graves was a little girl making dolls in her bedroom when she saw something she shouldn't and is trying to remember that lost trauma by making haunting sculptures. Long ago, something sinister and something hungry walked in the tunnels and mountains and the coal mines of their hometown in rural Pennsylvania. Now Nate and Maddie are married and they have moved back to their hometown with their son, Oliver. And now what happened a long time ago is happening again and is happening to Oliver. He meets a strange boy who becomes his best friend, a boy with secrets of his own and a taste for dark magic. Chuck join us, is joining us tonight from Bucks County in Pennsylvania. Joining Chuck in conversation this evening is Cassandra Kaw, Kaw's an award-winning game writer whose work can be found in places like fantasy and science fiction, Lightspeed, and Tor.com. Kaw's first original novella, Hammers on Bone, was a British Fantasy Award and Locus Award finalist. Their novel, The All-Consuming World, is due out in September, and their novella, Nothing But Blackened Teeth, is due out in October a very busy writer, so we thank Cassandra for joining us all the way from Montreal, Quebec tonight. This evening's event also includes an audience Q&A. If you have a question, please go to the Q&A button on the bottom of your screen and ask a question there, as well as if, uh, if someone has asked a question that you like and would like the answer to, you can hit the, the uh, thumbs up button to upvote that question. And more importantly, please consider supporting Chuck and Powell's by purchasing a book of his uh, copy of his new book and a link to buy the book of accidents, along with a link to buy Cassandra's books will be shared in the chat a couple of times this evening. Chuck, Cassandra, it's such a great pleasure to welcome you both. Thanks for joining us. Thank you. Thanks, Cassandra. This is awesome. Having us. I know it's weird though. We've known each other for ages, and I think this is only the second time we've seen each other face to virtual face. Yeah, it was just like a few weeks ago, right? Maybe a month or two ago, something like that. Was it only a few weeks ago? I keep thinking it was a few months ago. Time no it longer might matters been. in the pandemic. It, yeah, we're in the it point. Is all. Yeah. Oh, but speaking of that panel, you told a story there that I found absolutely fascinating. I think it tied to. The book of accidents there was a real life house and it was very very creepy oh that was the house i grew up in yeah oh god oh yeah that was like a real that was yeah that was my life as a tiny person who was living in a haunted house <laughs> could you tell for those of us who do not know that story yeah um about it again sure i uh for my whole youth and life in the uh, house well my i grew up in a house that was um, over 200 years old in uh, bucks county pennsylvania um which for america is a, an old house in other parts of the world it's like a, a new condo um but uh you know it's one of the things where in pennsylvania everybody sort of jokes like george washington slept here it always it's like it's not true it's obviously a lie that we tell to be uh, tourist friendly but um so yeah, I don't know uh, exactly when it started, but it started probably when I was very young, maybe around five years old is the first memory I have of it. And it was mostly um, electronics based stuff would happen. TVs would go on in the middle of the night. Um, 
my boom box would start playing and rewinding or, or, or it'd be top volume. Uh, I had a VCR that would sometimes rewind or fast forward. Sometimes it would spit out the tape and it would ruin VHS tapes, which, you know, when you're a kid and you have a substantial VHS collection of like movies, your cousins have taped off of HBO somewhere. That's very sad. So, um, uh, and my parents made me sleep in the attic, which uh, for the most part was cool because like I got my own like floor, but it was also a creepy attic and there were like above my head, squirrels and rats sort of crawling around at, at all hours of the night. And then um, the steps leading up to the attic, uh, I would hear footsteps up and down those steps all night long. So um, it became kind of like background noise to the house. And it, over time, it almost became weirdly comforting. Like it wasn't um, scary in the sense it was eerie, but it was like also a kind of a comforting eeriness. But the, the, the head trip and it's kind of the impetus for where Book of Accidents comes from is that uh, I was I did a Ouija board session with my cousin in the attic actually and uh, we got a name on that Ouija board and uh, that name I heard years later and I'd never heard it before Michael Thomas was the name we got and um, I went to uh, my dad years later having uh, questions about because I always thought the property we lived on, which was about 16 acres when I was a kid, but um, prior to that had gone all the way after the highway was a big farm. And I had thought it was just always in our family for whatever that meant in our family. So I was asking about that, like, you know, what did my great grandfather do with this property? Did he also have a farm? Uh, and my dad said, well, we didn't own this property then. Uh, it was this other family. And he said it was the Thomas family and their son had died out in the woods on the property. Uh, he went missing and died out there. And uh, so that was like, I would put that together and I tried to explain to him, like, I think the place is, I think our house is haunted, by the way. Uh, and he kind of treated it like it was like, shut up. Like my dad was like one of those, he was like a tough guy. He was like a John Wayne type. Um, I always tell people like the story of he cut his own pinky finger off with a pair of bolt cutters. Uh, mm -hmm. Like that's like, that's my dad was like, he didn't want to pay for a hospital bill. So he did that so he could save some money I mean, the doctors do it. So anyway, uh, he kind of treated it like it was bullshit. Like, eh, like he didn't want to talk about that. It was kind of beneath him to talk about. So, uh, but years later, after he had died, and I talked, was talking to my mom, and my mom was like, "Oh yeah, your father always thought this place was haunted. He had all these experiences too." And uh, it like kind of bummed me out because I was like, "Whatever sort of again, we're talking about cycles of abuse and generational trauma. Whatever it was, it sort of told him that he wasn't allowed to talk about these sort of things." especially with me, uh, prevented us from having that connection about real ghosts. So he was haunted by something, you know, real. And then we wanted to talk about the metaphorical or figurative hauntings or whatever you believe about ghosts. Um, and we couldn't, we couldn't connect on that front. And so out of that sort of those two things is the book of accidents. That weirdly parallels a story that happened in my own life, actually. Really? Yeah, that kind of creeps me out a bit. So my mom is like a diehard atheist. Uh, she's like, okay, the body is just flesh. It's just meat and bone. When I die, just put me in the dumpster for the love of God. Do not fucking waste money on my funeral. There are better uses for like money. The dead don't care. My corpse won't care. That kind of atheist, okay? Yeah. And so for the longest time, I've always seen her as this hardcore, I don't believe in anything skeptic. And the first house that we ever lived in, my sister and I were convinced there were ghosts. There were weird things happened. Like um, one of our dogs almost attacked us. I like almost killed my sister because she tried to pull the dog onto a couch with her while we thought a ghost was there. The dog just went for a trope. And like my mother never said anything about it. She just dismissed it. But when we left the house, we were like, you know what? We really did see a ghost like we saw multiple ghosts and my mom was like you know I've been all your lives I've been trying not to talk about it I'm like what are you talking about she's like and she told us one story and she never repeated it again she told it one time just one time in her life and she will never elaborate from there and so my parents slept in separate bedrooms the one day she came out of her own bedroom and she sees my dad going down the corridor to his and she's like she calls out to him he ignores her and she starts getting progressively angry, like, why is he ignoring me? And she follows him, raising her voice, shouting at him. And he turns the corner into his room, pulls the door shut behind him. And as she reaches for the doorknob, 
she hears my father shout at her like, what are you doing? Why are you shouting at me? And she turns around to see him at the landing of the staircase, glaring at her. And apparently she took one look at him, turned around, went to her room, closed the door, kept it locked, and didn't come out for the rest of the day. Oh my God. And my mom had a really difficult childhood as well. So yeah, it's kind of similar in that whatever she experienced prevented her from having that conversation with us because she had a very set idea of what is correct, what is not correct. And this is how you interact with your children. And there is no other way around it. Oh my gosh. Um, That's the book of accidents. We We all live together. the experience. Uh, But yeah, like I think I've always been a sucker for haunted house narratives because whatever it was, it felt like grew up in one. Yeah. And the other reason for that, there's always a family um, in every haunted house. There are always people hoping for new beginnings, hoping this is where they will find peace and this is where they will find comfort. And in this place where one should be completely safe, where you can put down your, your guard, where you can relax, bad things happen. And that gets to me in a very, very specific way because I consider like my den to be a sacred place. But what about you? Like are haunted house stories a thing that you're interested in or is a book of accidents more of an unusual case? No, I, I always am fascinated with haunted house stories. Um, again, for that sort of reason that it's it's this, it's very rarely, uh, although sort of separate from my own experiences, it's very rarely a place that the people just live in. It's almost always a place that as you know, people are going to, whether it's a new beginning or they're forced to do it, or in the shining sense, he's taking on a job that's, you know what I mean? Or, or I'm gonna clean this asylum. And so that's this uh, uh, haunted space. Um, and it's always like you're in, in some sense, it's almost like you're the intruder to the haunted liminal space. Um, whereas of course in reality, you know, as you know, people just live in haunted houses. They don't, it's not necessarily about moving there and being like, oh my God, this is haunted. It's like, no, I just, I live here and it, this is a thing that's happening. Um, so yeah, no, it's very interesting to me to sort of have that, um, component of, because the fascinating thing about a haunted house isn't just that it's that intrusion of, um, living people into the space of the dead, but it's also this idea of reiterative history and people being haunted by larger, stranger, squirrelier things than just the literal dead. I mean, there's always, it's always that you're haunted. It's like how in zombie films, like the bad guys are never really the zombies. It's always other people. It's like, that one of those key things with haunted houses is it's not just about the ghosts, it's about the sort of metaphorical figurative ghosts that we're haunted by. Whatever Do you have family. a favorite haunted house story? Do you have like a favorite or movie or book or anything? I don't actually have a favorite one. I have favorite experiences because kind of growing up in Malaysia, the thing that we used to do, so there were two separate camps. There were the people who believed in ghosts and the supernatural and stayed the fuck away from it because Malaysia was very interesting in that um, black magic was oddly common. Interesting. Like one, of, one of the practices that we knew about, like everyone knew about, was there were Pontianas, a kind of vampiric ghosts of a sort, who kind of lurk around Malaysia and it's possible for you to catch one late at night if you hear one whispering in a banana tree what you do is you wrap it around wrap the tree with red string and during the day and you spear it with like a knitting needle and it pins the pontiana there supposedly and then you can start doing stuff like asking it for like lottery numbers while it squirms and screams in pain because you have just impaled the poor thing Boy, I need to get on the ghost catching business. I didn't like think you could use them for things. I thought it was just a cure. Like, tell me tomorrow's sports scores. But yeah, like, so there's one camp of people who are like, we're not touching this. We know that's there. Let's stay away from it. And there was another group, which was unfortunately my group and oddly enough ties to my own book, but we'll, we'll get to that in our conversation later. <laughs> yeah. And we were the we're ghost talking, hunters. Yeah, everybody. We, we're having a conversation too with yes. Commanders, uh, All Consuming World, when that comes out. But yeah, there was another group of people who would just go to all the allegedly haunted houses and haunted buildings across Malaysia. We would break into buildings and go past locked doors to look for ghosts. Yeah. The whole time completely aware of the fact that if we find them, we might die. Yeah. 
that's that's totally oddly tracks with my youth here in Pennsylvania. We really? always chasing down weird folklore, or there's like a whole book called Weird New Jersey. And when I mm -hmm. finally found that year, it was I think it started as a website. Um, but when I found it years later, I was like, oh yeah, this tracks to my youth. Like, you know, there was like this one uh, road called Hansel Road, and you had to go, you had to turn off your headlights and drive down this long gravel path. And you had to say Fritz come out and play, and then a ghost light would travel across the road, and it was and it was supposedly a boy who had lost his head, and so different stories had either him replacing his head with a lantern or he was holding his own head, which glowed. Whatever the folklore was that you believed there was Fritz come out and play was, and it was a very hyper local. Like I don't, I haven't found this anywhere else. Um, just one of those weird things local like ghostly folklore like that always freaks me out again another parallel of uh, back home in malaysia there was a specific highway that was allegedly haunted and like this little car if you were driving down the road at the wrong time of night would try to speed up and like try to overtake you or something like that and if you passed it or looked the wrong way and you turned and there would be just this corpse like this bloody grisly corpse driving and allegedly the sight of it will cause you to crash and stuff yeah so th and that's fascinating because like the, the racing component is mirrored here too. We have a few different really? things around here. Um, the tunnel in Book of Accidents is based on a tunnel in a town called Percocet, Pennsylvania. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's, uh, the train conductor supposedly leaned out and another train oh, took no. head off. So, but now you go there and you supposedly try to race the train, which I don't know why you would try to ever race a train, ghostly or otherwise, on your feet. But <laughs> who knows kids are crazy uh and then on the where i grew up was a place called buckingham mountain and if you went to the top of the mountain supposedly the devil was there and he you could challenge him to a race and of course if you won you could almost like pinning the ghost you could get something from him but if he won he got your soul and or you die what is your favorite piece of like really grisly folklore like the thing you think about the most there's it can a be um, funny too yeah, uh, there's a lot of really weird ones, even just around here. There's uh, supposedly there's another mountain called Haycock Mountain nearby here. Um, and it, Buckingham Mountain and Haycock Mountain are not mountains by any stretch of the imagination in anywhere in the world, but we call them mountains because we have, I guess, you know, inadequacy uh, issues. But uh, <laughs> supposedly, if you go to the top of Haycock Mountain, there is a creepy old greenhouse and in the creepy old greenhouse lives a cult of uh, albino cannibals and the albino cannibals will hide in the trees and uh, they will drop down on you like i don't know like bug bears yeah like bug bears <laughs> they'll come down on you and uh they they <laughs> scoop you up into the trees and drag you off to the uh, uh greenhouse where they eat you presumably because cannibals this is very specific. Like the details are specific, just yeah. so oddly specific. I just looked it up recently online and I haven't finished the video yet, but there was like an old guy just like, I'm gonna go videotape myself going through the woods trying to find the cannibals. <laughs> okay. Did he find it? Uh, I didn't I didn't watch the video. I didn't finish <laughs> it yet. I feel bad. I haven't actually gotten all the way through it. It's not very exciting. It's like a guy oh. walking through the woods for 27 minutes or something like that. You're like, well, up. knowing how the world works these days with all of the creepy pasta stuff, I wouldn't be surprised if it turns out like something's gonna jump at you at the end of the video. Probably, yeah. But he looked like, I mean, he looked like he's in his sixties, so I'm not. He, I don't. He doesn't look like the kind of guy who would know what creepy pasta is. That uh, is fair. But maybe, maybe. I'm curious if there is any like oddly funny folklore that is also kind of creepy in America, because for example. Like this is a very specific like sub genre I'm asking because there's weird stuff like that in Malaysia. For example, there is a ghost called the Hantu Tete, which literally translates to the breast ghost. And it is a ghost that runs around suffocating people to death with her enormous boobs. <laughs> and I've never been able to understand. I'm pretty certain whoever came up with that was probably very sexually frustrated, but like that piece of folklore has stuck in my head. It's fascinating. This is just so silly. Yeah. Is We're so puritanical else? here. I don't think what? we would even allow that kind of folklore. I'm sure there's weird, wacky folklore, but stuff like that. Yeah, I don't know. It's always creepy or murdery or we can't, we can't, we don't have enough fun over here. We're a little Aww. too. Uh, that makes know. me sad. You should always have fun with the creepy things that want to kill you dead. We really should.
I agree with that. That's always an interesting thing. Uh, like the toils are probably one of my favorite things from Malaysia. Um, they're essentially tiny dead fetuses that people keep inside, like preserve inside fluids. And you're supposed to feed them some of your blood and entertain them with toys. And in exchange, they will steal things from you. And I've actually gone to houses where I've seen those little guys in bottles stuck on people's altars. Really? Yes. Oh my gosh. But yeah, yep. Malaysia has a lot of fun things. We need to do better over here. But America does have the Mothman, which we I've never been able to Mothman's understand. Pretty He's silly. adorable. Yeah, Mothman's silly. Bigfoot's silly. Like, we have some silly ones. Usually the monsters. The creep. The monsters are kind of goofy. The monsters are kind of goofy. I, I can't imagine ever being afraid of Mothman. Yeah. Yeah, um, I think I'd, I'd like to hang out with Mothman. I mean, as long as he doesn't, like, you know, portend my doom in some way. No, I would like to hug him, though. He looks like he's a very fuzzy thing. And he's yeah, probably what kind of moth is? That's the question. Like, if he's especially if he's like a lunar, like a luna moth, that'd be nice. Like a big... I know. That'd be good. Um, but yeah, since... For another question, like, since I'm dragging you randomly down a rabbit hole of... I like this rabbit hole. Rabbit hole. <laughs> I'm in. Um... This might be a little bit twee, but like since we're the last stop in a virtual tour, I thought it might be appropriate to go down this particular route. Um, the Book of Accidents is just hopeful in a way. I think that horror almost always isn't um, bad things happen, like horrible things happen, like horrible, oh my God, horrible things happen. Yeah. But you don't build that mountain of corpses and tragic tragedy you give us hope instead now i have my suspicions about why you went that direction but i kind of want to hear about it here because it feels like a really deliberate choice oh it's very made this book so much bleaker uh yeah i try to um i don't feel good about horror that is always nihilistic um not to say there's not a place for that and i don't like it but i don't i don't like it as a trend um just because I think horror um, is served best when it's got that uh, counterpoint, um, humor and hope and heart, those things uh, deepen the horror. I mean, they sort of highlight the sort of the darkness, you know, and you don't, I mean, it's so cliched to say, but like shadows and darkness are only effective if you have light to create them. You know what I mean? Otherwise it's just kind of bleak and black. Um, again, suitable for some stories, and I certainly love some of those stories that end with like the mountain of corpses and the tragedy. But I, I just, you know, it's funny because Wanderers was a book that obviously was really explicitly political and that it was dealing with quite literally politics. Um, a presidential candidate was involved and it was about political response to this um, unfolding both the sleepwalker situation and the pandemic that was uh, parallel to them. Um, but at the same time, Book of Accidents is in many ways a uh, a more political book, or at least more an intimately political book, because it's a, a response in part to sort of everything going on right now. But I feel like I wanted to talk about pain and the reiterative nature of pain and how we trade it and what we can do with it. And, um, you know, dealing with uh, the ideas of empathy, empathy, both as a, um, a almost a heroic trait and a a vulnerability too, and in some ways it can be used as a weapon and just sort of like kind of dealing with all this stuff. But I don't think you get to deal with all those things if you don't have a little bit of that hope and heart in there. Otherwise it just feels kind of like a trick, like a cruelty. It does. And I think we don't really need more of that right now. Not of the client our landscape. Yeah. And Twitter being this continuous nightmare of, oh God, did this really happen? Yes, it has happened. Yeah, and it's still there, happening. Yeah. Yeah. There are just so many things that are happening in Twitter that I have to constantly stop and double check and go, like, is this from the onion? Oh no, this is just part of the climate apocalypse. This yep. is happening. This, this is, is where our life is going. Yeah, everything is fine. Everything's everything good. This is fine. We're all past well, it. I'm curious about. What is your favorite part of the Book of Accidents, the part that you most enjoy writing? Because I know for me, there are bits where it feels like pulling teeth and then there are bits where I'm like, oh, I hope everyone loves this little bit because I so enjoyed writing it. Uh, I liked um, the epilogue, which I won't spoil here, but I really liked There's a, The last line of the book is a book I, I actually feel really good about. It's not often I feel like super good about 
something like that. But on the sort of gleeful, twisted side of things, there's a, um, a part maybe halfway through the book where a boy gets trapped in a mine. Oh and, God, no. Um, it's a long, um, <laughs> upsetting, I wrote that in one session. I, I just, I log flume rode through the dark tunnels of that coal mine uh, into the into hell and back out again. Um, and that was, <laughs> I really like enjoyed writing that section just because it was so uh, weirdly it's crazy to do. It felt like a descent in a way to do it. Um, and it was really fun to write that section. Uh, that was a very distressing section. It's a distressing section. Section. I was very upset about the whole thing. Yeah. I have to turn on my lights again. Oh, because no. I was just sitting here going, oh, what is going on? This is going in very dark places. I don't know what's happening. And I'm worried. My That's grandfather it. was a coal miner, mm -hmm. actually. And he, oh. the, the story was always that he died of black lung. Uh, but then it was only like a, recently that I learned that he died of like bowel cancer. And they just didn't want to say that because it didn't sound like a good way to die. So black lung was more of like a working man's way to go. And I was like, Boy, again, that just like slots right into that sort of book of accidents thing. Like you can't talk about how he really died. I mean, it's got to be something more working man noble. It's it's interesting how I think older generations have this sense of like, we need to hide certain things from the younger generations. We need to hide things from our descendants. I keep wondering if it's, I don't know, influence from the war? Yeah, where depression era, yeah. Yes, the Great Depression and what have you. Because it kind of happened with my family as well. Again, lots of parallels. Yes. Slightly eerie, very appropriate for the particular conversation. <laughs> we are kin. We're kin. Yes. Yeah. Um, so like my grandfather, for example, when I was young, um, I got to know the fact that he was a gold smuggler and that was how he made the family wealth. And I'm like, cool, okay. And then it was far, much, much, much later that I learned how much wealth he had, but only through rumor. And I think it was about a year or two after that, I was like, wait, if he's a gold smuggler who belted gold bars under his shirt and just kind of dragged them off across the border, he must have had a supplier and he must have had a buyer. I'm like, what is <laughs> happening in my family? And then there were That's also perfect. things, and there were also things that I knew my dad was kind of involved in a triad, and he was like, oh, sometimes I like, yeah, I took care of people, I beat them up a bit, you know, and slowly I realized he never told me stories of whether they got up again, and I recently <laughs> I found out he also stole motorcycles in his view, oh and, my, and I was like, I remember looking at my mom and going, what is up with my dad's side of the family, and she looks back at me and goes, do you really want to know? <laughs> You're like, well, yes, yeah. and also no. But it's also interesting because I know I'm in a way of perpetual continuing the cycle that we're talking about, like keeping very specific limits. Yeah. And it's interesting how we inherit that because I think part of it comes from people needing to be resilient in the face of incredible pain yes. and incredible hardship. But that kind of turns septic after a while, doesn't it? It does. It does. That pain can curdle a little bit. Yeah. And if you don't know how to deal with it, like you said, septic. Yeah. It just sits there. And I, I think I really do enjoy how um, I almost, especially Gen Z is getting really enthusiastic about talking about this, discussing boundaries, um, establishing limitations. Um, Simone, I cannot pronounce her last name, the gymnast. Mm -hmm. There were two gymnasts in the Olympics who were talking about, no, I'm taking a step back for yes. yeah, mental my health. health. Yes. Physical and health, I, sure. It's kind of incredible because I think even 10 years ago, we wouldn't be seeing that from people, not if they were on the world stage. No, it's odd that that's revolutionary. It, it, it shouldn't feel revolutionary, but it does. I mean, it, it is. Um, it's a shame that it's um, such a brave choice to take care of yourself like it, it um it, you know it certainly isn't something you were expected to be able to do or even allowed to do i mean then obviously there's still huge resistance to her taking that that mm -hmm. time and there's people telling her how she should be 
basically literally taking one for the team. Like you should get out there and just like, well, if you get hurt, you get hurt. That's the, it was like, they have just no concept of um, her autonomy and protecting herself. And uh, it's a shame. Self-care is incredibly radical. Like you said, it's kind of, it's kind of horrible that it's kind of an unusual thing. Yeah. Um, yeah. But kind of like talking about self-care, um, where do you find hope these days? For you personally, where do you find the joy in life? Because as everyone knows, we're living through essentially the end of the world. Uh, at least the end of some part of it. Yeah. Yes. I don't know what, what, you know, it's like in the tarot card sense, like death doesn't always mean death, but it still means something is something stopping. And I don't know where that is for us, but um, yeah, it's strange. I, I find it. And of course, it's a double-sided coin because I find a lot of hope in my son. My son is a, a a kid who was not like me. I was a very sort of shy, retired, sensitive kid. I, um, you know, like Oliver in the book, I was definitely that like tooth without enamel kind of a thing. So, uh, but my son is he's very resilient and a very brave kid, and and not like brave in a sense that he's um, uh, runs off half cocked into the street. I just mean like he's he's confident and comfortable and. Uh, in a way that I don't know where it came from. I feel like I couldn't have possibly given this to you because I don't have that. So it must be all my life. I don't know where he's just great. And, but at the same time, then that makes me feel sad because I don't know what his adulthood is going to be like um, and what the world will be like for him. Hopefully we will do something and turn some of this around. I don't know. Uh, certainly not all of it, um, but it's, so that's also like a tough side. So it's like hopeful because I believe if anybody, and this is some of the stuff that goes in a book of accents. There's a conversation in there that um, one of the characters is, ha is having a child and he's asking Nate, who has an older son, like, how do you do it? How do you have a kid in the midst of all of this chaos and pain? And, you know, Nate tries to justify it. And it's like the same kind of thing. It's one of those times where it's a little bit of my voice in there where it's like, well, the world has always been challenging and troublesome certainly a hundred years ago would have felt in many ways a lot worse or if i were living through the dust bowl in 30s america would have felt like the apocalypse um and you know maybe your unborn child will be one of the ones who helps you know lead the charge on climate change or whatever so you just you don't really know and the best you can do is try to bring some light and love into the world uh, however you can that, that section made me cry too. Well, I think a lot of the book that I spent a lot of nights just sitting there sobbing over my Kindle, <laughs> not because I think of the tragic parts or the scary parts, but those conversations especially. And you did such an amazing job at filling the book with it. Like Thank just, you. it's so full of people who are aware that they're coming up against impossible odds, dark magic, demonic forces. And you're not going to stop hoping. And one of the things that I loved about it is how each of them had a different way of handling that darkness. Um, Maddie and her artistic side, the way Nate had that seawall, that way of pushing things back and holding himself separate from the things that pulls at him. And Oliver, God, I love Oliver so much as a character. Thank you. Oh, he's such a wonderful kid. Yeah, his, yeah, and it's funny, like the seawall and the art and Oliver's empathy are also, they're both their weapons and also the thing that they have to be careful about. Because if you rely too much on those things and not allow each other into those spaces, and then it becomes more about the family than their individual ways. It kind of starts off with these three sort of separate people. And then, um, and that was another thing that was sort of a conscious choice is I didn't want it to be one of those like, well, the family has secrets from each other and it's those secrets that drive tension and conflict and uh, they're willfully not telling each other important things for the whole story or one of them has to die to make the other, you know what I mean? I didn't want it to be um, that kind of sacrificial choice um, for the narrative. I, I mean, certainly we make a lot of choices for plot and narrative, but um, leading with character and sort of leading with that willful um, optimism in the face of uh, some considerable horror uh, mm -hmm. was, uh, was a choice. Since we're on the topic, I am curious. You touched a little bit about on that in your other answer, but like, what haunted house trope do you loathe the most? The one that makes you roll your eyes? Um, I, I mean, I don't know. I think anytime you have to see 
and this is mostly a visual thing because it doesn't really mm -hmm. play well in literary, but they always want to show you a ghost and not like whether it's gauzy or whether it's a person just standing there, that's very hard to do well in a way that makes it feel anything other than illusion breaking. Um, not to say you can't do it again, some pieces do it very well, but um, if you, you pop a bubble when you start to like reveal because the, the power of like the haunted house and the power of ghosts is the fear of the unknown. There's so much, the fact that the ghost is always sort of behind that literal veil of what we can see. It, it's more troubling when you can't see something that's directly in front of you, or it's more troubling when something is jarring in the way there's two different things happening that don't line up. Um, if something lines up a little too nice and neat, or you try to too visually hang a, a hat on that hook, um, it starts to feel a little trite. How about you? Do you have anything that bugs you about a haunted house uh, sort of trope? Honestly, that that somebody always has to die. It feels like somebody always needs to get possessed. Somebody always needs to suffer. Not to say that it cannot be well done, but like it always comes up. It's like what you said. There is always like, oh, now we're keeping secrets from each other, or some like somebody needs to be tormented so that the other person can grow and see yeah. the woman who suffers horrifically. Of course. Horrific. Yeah, classic. Yeah, yeah unfortunately. Um, but I think this sort of dovetails into the q and A's segment right. of our conversation. Let's see, we only have three questions so far and I'm yeah. going to start with the one that I'm very curious about as well. Is that a pick on your cabbage? That is a, a uh, yeah. That's a pickaxe on my couch. Why Just do you have a pickaxe on your couch? <laughs> well, again, my family were coal miners. So, you know, it's one of those things where, and my dad always had, my dad had like cleavers and just, uh, he had literally a wall of cleavers. I don't know why he didn't use them. Uh, That's yeah. very disconcerting. It is very disconcerting. Yeah. Yeah. They were, they were just a wall of cleavers. Um, yeah. So, but the, the pickaxe is just one of those things that, I, I think I inherited, although this one I think from my mother's side, but yeah. That's always. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, and we have another question. It is from Jonathan Leto again, and I cannot pronounce the last name in this, in this question, but I have a Hillary Bissenniak style question. What was your favorite part of Book of Accidents that you had to cut? Ooh, um, I'm trying to think of why. You know, we didn't, I don't know that we cut any big specific sections, but I will say that it's like that the area in the, um, or the part of the story that has the descent into the mine, um, I wanted that to be its own piece. Like I said, like a continuous thread, but then I also, and I'm trying not to spoil too much here, when Nate goes on a trip, we'll just say that, that was one massive section in the book. It literally, like, the story stopped, and then there was like 20 or 30,000 words of that piece. And uh, at the time, I was like, this is amazing. It will be like, you're like, it's like a book in a book, and you'll like kind of stop here and you'll go through this sort of hallucinogenic other part of the journey. And then it, it, it completely, uh, uh, it, you know, ruined the pacing of the book. It just cut it right in half. So, uh, that was like, I really liked the way I had it, but it doesn't work in the story. So then we sort of uh, took it out and part of then the new fun, because I really like editing and I really enjoy that sort of tinkering and, and re-threading all the pieces was then breaking this huge chunk up and pacing it throughout that part of the book. So we sort of moved back and forth between the perspectives of the characters. I mean, it actually lent a greater attention to the story and also didn't stop it dead in its tracks, which is always a good thing to not try to just, you know, like smother your story with a pillow. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. Um, this is a fun question. What kind of dark magic did you summon to write the book of accidents? I'm very curious uh, to know. Did it involve necromancy or did it involve blood sacrifices? Yeah, it's just, I, I, the, if I tell people the pick will get angry. I don't, I don't want the pick actually get mad. So I don't, I just have to, it's listening right now and I don't want to. <laughs> <Yeah. Yeah>. um, <laughs> so you've done a few different genres. Have you found it difficult to shift? Or what has surprised you about bouncing between genres, really? 
Um, yeah, I've done a lot of different genres and formats. Um, I think, first of all, part of it is like, secretly, I'm mostly always writing a horror novel. You just couldn't call it that because horror was kind of like not as much of a thing. Like you weren't, for a long time, horror was a little more anathema. I mean, not universally, but um, publishers were a little more hesitant to be like, yes, we want horror fiction. It was always like, no, 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 this is urban fantasy. And this is, this is supernatural suspense. You're like, okay, it's still horror, but you just don't want to call it that. Um, so, I mean, Zeros is a science fiction novel, but it's a horror novel. It's a body horror novel. Invasive is a science fiction novel, but for God's sake, it has ants that literally snip your skin off and make a farm out of it. Like, it's not, it's not a happy, it's a, it's a scary, it's meant to be a scary book. Um, the Miriam Black books, I mean, they're, I wrote them as straight up horror crime novels and, uh, no publisher wanted to call them horror so really uh, part of it, yeah so they were the uh, angry robot the first publisher called it uh, urban fantasy and then simon and schuster picked them up and they call them supernatural suspense and uh both are wrong they're horror crime novels that's what i intended anyway so um but genre is just a thing we made up it's just nonsense that's so really true. um but i also think there's something that wants you kind of both read broadly and write broadly and, and whether you're doing it freelance or whatever you kind of start to see that um, and, you know, I think you probably experienced this because you're, you're writing for both video games and, and pen and paper role playing games. And mm -hmm. um, you start to see that there's all of these common bones of storytelling that, yeah, maybe there's a slightly different configuration, but like a human and a dolphin, we look very different. But on the inside, there are some some common bones in there. And once you begin to know those common bones, you can start to make whatever weird animal you want and make it uh, walk and move around. Oh, also, I love this question. It is the latest one. I promise I will get back to the ones that were above that, but I have to ask this one first because it's delightful. Something that female writers are asked a lot, but not men. How do you balance being an involved parent with the level of work it takes for to write as extensively as you do? Uh, that's a good. That's a good question. Um, right? Yeah, just it's like uh, I have a set specific schedule, and like part of it was separating. Like I have this room, which is separate from the house. Um, and so it allows me just enough time sort of like away from him when it needs to be. And then when it comes time to go deal with him, whether it's school stuff or um, making meals and uh, or, or reading or drawing or whatever it is we're doing together art artistically, um, it's having those sort of separated spaces and being able to sort of travel between them almost like a the land of the living and the land of the dead. I'm, I'm going from this this strange mad dead place <laughs> to the land of the living where my uh, son is the, the star. My person tends to be a very good thing. I think I do that a lot as well. I have a very regimented schedule and like you need to have different head spaces. I think so, yeah, I think it's vital. Um, with your haunted childhood experiences, do you find that writing horror is cathartic for you or do you just enjoy telling a scary story? Or is it both? Uh, oh yeah, it's both. Like I, I mean, horror is cathartic. I think I, I always say that uh, horror is like the uh, sorcerer who summons demons into a summoning circle. It's a safe place to make the demons fight or kiss or whatever it is you want the demons to do. Now you kiss demons. Um, so it's like a, a safe place for your anxieties to do Thunderdome style battle um, is in the, 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 the scope and expanse of a horror story. Um, but also it's super fun to just uh, freak the heck out of people. Um, and I'm enjoying that very much with Book of Accidents, seeing people be like, I'm generally freaked out about this. I'm like, good. That was, that was as intended. I was, I was going for that. You might be happy to know I absolutely cannot do zeros because of the ends. It freaks me out far too much. Yeah. And yeah, this uh, part, uh, huh? the whole thing. Yeah, the answer to thing. It's also partially because uh, when I was a teenager, I accidentally stood in a nest of like those giant army ants. Oh God. And I only found out much later as they were crawling out from under my sleeve and they were about this big. And they were in my hair, they were in my shirt. And it was about 30 minutes of me and a friend just standing there while he carefully picked them off me. Oh. So nothing bit and lost its shit. And to this day, it still ends up waking me up just a little bit, just a tiny bit. It's fair. I think that's fair. I have a lot of weird experiences growing up in Malaysia, I'm beginning to realize. <laughs> Do you see an upside to hauntings? That is, 
for hunting is useful? That's a very um, interesting question. That's an interesting question. I feel like James is trying to make money off ghosts. James, if you just yes. okay. just say that, just say you want to monetize ghosts in this capitalistic hell society we live in, you've just got to sell ghosts for cash. No, uh, I don't know. I mean, like I said, for me growing up, I um, it was scary at times, but also comforting. Like, I don't know. It, like, it's just part of like the, like I said, almost like the background noise of the, the house in which I lived was hearing voices and sometimes you hear a song in the walls. It was a very strange thing or the footsteps. Like, it's just the thing you sort of like, yeah. Yeah. And like I had, I, it, what's great is I had friends who experienced these things with me. So I didn't feel quite so um, completely alone, but no, I, I, um, yeah, I guess in that sense, they could be kind of useful. Otherwise I don't know, unless you're pinning ghosts to trees and uh, exhorting from them um, lottery numbers. I don't know that they're literally useful in like the sense of like, go dig a ditch ghost, do, do things for me. The whole Ponty Anna and the banana tree thing still freaks me out. I have one very distinct memory of passing by this enormous fucking mansion in Malaysia and there was this corpse of like banana trees and every single one of them had red tread and like a needle stuck through them and I'm like large house banana trees I never took that path home again I say nope not walking there I do not want to know the story of this house no, that person cannot like, be good that's a rich person and that's how he became rich is by spearing ghosts to trees and making them make him money first of all so of course, the problem with that, though, is the flip side of that story is if the ghost gets loose, it will try to eat you, which I think it's incredibly fair if, you know, fair. you got impaled for God knows how many years. I would be pissed. I would try to eat the person's face. <laughs> I would immediately try to eat that person, yeah. Um, let's see. Okay, this appears to be a question for both of us. Ooh. For both of you, when you write in an established genre, such as haunted houses, do you think much about the tradition you're writing in? Or is it more simply about writing the story you have to tell? Mm, what are your thoughts? I don't really think about the storytelling tradition, honestly. Um, again, I think it comes from growing up in Malaysia. Um, we were really multicultural and everyone had their own ideas and rituals and ways of telling stories. And you kind of magpie all of it. And you built your own stories of the bones of that. And it was incredibly easy because it was definitely a, there was a writer whose name I cannot remember right now. And he said this one quote about Malaysia that I haven't been able to shape. And it was essentially, there are more ghosts in Malaysia than there are human beings. <laughs> Makes sense. That tracks. I mean. Yes. Yeah. And like, it was a country where in August we had this thing called the Hungry Ghost Festival. And you would see things like the get eyes, which is basically performances that were being held for the dead. And there would be people just singing to an empty swath of seats all night till like 4 a.m. in the morning. And it was hard not to build your own stories out of it. If yeah. any of my stories feel like they come from the tradition of things. It's because it's something I picked up by osmosis, but I didn't grow up in an environment where I had to fixate on a single idea. Also, somebody's, oh, yeah. That's cool. What about yeah. you? Do you think about the tradition of stuff? Um, I don't know. I, I don't, I try not to worry too much about it because it's not that those things don't matter, uh, but they can be kind of a trap. Like you said, there's this aspect of like, maybe you know the bones and then you use them to make your own kind of traditions out of it. Um, and I always like to think that if I'm going to write something and if I stumble upon those things, it's, it's because I've absorbed them and I found them interesting in some way and they work here in the story. But if I think about them too consciously, it kind of gums me up a little too much. I, I don't, mm -hmm. I mostly just let the characters kind of drive and then they move into the spaces I think they need to move into. And if that happens to coincide and cross over with, um, tropes and traditions, then that's totally fine. And I'm not um, a, a, averse to that in any way, but I don't plan for that necessarily. I don't try to map out and like chart those like kind of tropey traditional beats. Oh, that's kind of fun. It, in a way, writers are haunted by their own stories too, I think. They really are, you're not wrong. Like we're just kind of followed around by the images and the characters until we tell their stories. Yeah, yeah. This is one that haunted me for a long time. Um, 
I don't think we have any more questions. I actually have one more All right, for you for me personally. Uh, you've mentioned there have been multiple iterations of the Book of Accidents. Yeah. What were the previous versions of this book like? I'm curious about how it grew over the years. Uh, yeah, I tried to write this book. It wasn't called the Book of Accidents then, but it was the, kind of the core idea. I tried to write it about 20 years ago and about 10 years ago. Um, 20 years ago, I actually finished the book. Uh, I got to the end um, and it contained some of the same things that were in this book, coal mine and bullies. And, but there was also like some other weirder stuff like like a uh, tribe of creatures down in the mine. And it, it was a very, it was terrible. It was awful. And it was like, it's one of those, like they say trunk novels, like, oh, it was my trunk novel. Like this should literally be in a lead line trunk buried six oh, feet deep no. in the yard so that no one can ever see it. Uh, it was super not good. So then 10 years ago, I tried writing it again. And uh, I, I remembered none of it. Like I, it was, I went back and I looked at it and I remembered not a single word of the book. I didn't remember the characters. I didn't remember what I was trying to accomplish. And I stopped at around like 60, 70,000 words. Um, and it was fascinating that I just wrote this thing. I have no memory of writing. I fumed oh, wow. out during that entire experience. Um, and then this time I was just, uh, I think I was the finally the writer to maybe tell the story a little bit. Um, sometimes, you know, the book is the wrong book, but sometimes the book is the right book and you're just the wrong writer at that time. And I was the wrong writer for a very long time uh, for this book, but I think maybe I was the right writer now. Yes, definitely. I do not cry very often in books and you still made me cry. And I'm not sure if I'm upset or very happy at you about it. The epilogue, yeah. especially if you're thinking about it, you mentioned the last line. It's the one that sticks with me. Thank you. Yeah. And, and also, really sorry. Mm -hmm. thank you and sorry. Like, you don't know if you're, if it's good or bad. Thank you and sorry. It's always a weird thing when you write horror, isn't it? Like people come yeah. up to you and they're like, I didn't sleep all night because of your book. God damn it. And you're like, thank you. I'm glad you suffered, baby. What yeah, like stories. Like, you know, it's a weird thing, even just to be a storyteller in general, because you're, you are at some level trying to cause uh, like a uh, anxiety yes. <laughs> in the reader. You're trying to upset people to some degree. Um, maybe not in a permanent way. And maybe that's part of the power of that sort of catharsis is you're trying to like, it's almost like a vaccine. You're trying to inoculate them with like anxiety. So then when they get in the real world, they're like, oh, the book prepared me for this stuff. Uh, but it, and it definitely is like, you're trying to tangle up all these feelings mm -hmm. and make confused and stuff. And it's it's fun and we're, we're maybe awful people. I'm not really sure. <laughs> Let's, I hope we're not. <laughs> no, but if, too, yeah. yeah, but well, if we are, we are. That is are, unfortunately the lot that we've picked in life. That's, yeah, exactly. <laughs> but yeah, if there are no more questions from the audience, yeah. Thank I you, think everybody. we are done. Thanks for Thank coming. Thank you, everyone, for coming. Thank you so much, Cassandra, for doing this. This has been wonderful. It's been so nice. Thank you for being around here. Thanks, Cassandra. Thanks, Chuck. Um, what a wild conversation. It's like a, a lot of different <laughs> things uh, discussed tonight. Um, all right, everyone. In the chat, uh, I am posting the uh, YouTube channel, Powell's YouTube channel. You can watch this event again or tell your friends about it. Um, probably be showing up there tomorrow afternoon. You can also watch all the other events that we've been hosting during this uh, Zoom age. And um, I'm also going to right now post a link again to Chuck's book, which is right here, by the way, Book of Accidents. Buy the book, it's really good. And look, this one's even signed. I think we have signed ones in the store. Um, Cassandra, you're, you're, you're busy, busy, busy. You have a novella in this mm -hmm. book as well, which I think also just came out a couple months ago. Yes, it was in uh, March. We're excited to see your books in the very, very near future. Pre-order all consuming world. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, uh, Thanks again for uh, joining us tonight for the talk. Thanks everyone for tuning in and uh, we'll see you next time. Have a good Thank night. You everybody. Good night. Everybody.